Hi, I'm Beth Comstock. Today I get to sit down with Hope Jaron, a botanist, a research scientist, and an author of one of my favorites, Lab Girl. We're going to talk about the future of science and how we think differently in science's place in the world. This is the future in five. So tell us who you are and what's your story. My name is Hope Jaron and I study plants. Uh, I've always worked within the academic setting. Uh, I do research on how plants grow, why they grow, and when they don't grow. It has implications for forestry and for agriculture uh, and some for medicine. Um, and I work experimentally. I run a lab. I manage all the people who work in the lab and I communicate with my peers and I also communicate with the broader public and that gives me great joy. Which you've done in a magnificent book called Lab Girl. It's one of my favorites. Uh, I put it on my reading list and uh, I, I know a lot of people have. It's been quite well, uh, it's done quite well and been very well acclaimed. One of the things I love is that you communicate about science so clearly. How, have you always been that way and how, how, what, what urged you, to, what was the urging to make, have you write Lab Girl? What, what was behind that? I was a very little girl in my father's laboratory, which is where the name comes from. And so I first understood these concepts in a profound way through touching and talking and thinking uh, as a child. And so the, the beautiful um, part of science to me is still the way which we absorb it naturally and um, sort of innocently and not childishly but uh, with our eyes open and coming to it without experience, uh, without the benefit of being an insider. That still for me is the most joyful way to talk about science. Well you do bring a joy to the way you, you tell the story. I, what I love about Lab Girl is you tell your story, so it's memoir-esque. You also give us a biology lesson kind of in every chapter. I studied biology in school and I feel like I learned more about botany reading your book than I ever did from my teachers. And so I think there's so much to offer in the book that, um, that brings to life just the challenge of working in, in science. I mean, it's a, I don't know that people appreciate as a research scientist just the challenge to get funding. It's a constant funding, right? And we talk a lot in, in business about entrepreneurism and it's like you just snap your fingers and you get money. It doesn't work that way in science. It's hard work, right? It is, and there are, it's hard work, and it's getting harder. I mean, there are structural uh, realities at play in that for the last 30 years, the amount of federal funds that have been designated for science have been 3% of the federal budget. This is non-defense related science. And the different administrations talk differently about valuing science, but that number has remained absolutely flat for 30 years. The problem is that people like me keep educating new generations of scientists that want to practice their skill, that want to cure diseases, that want to find a way to go to Mars, that want to do all these things. And we're really just now reaching a breaking point where uh, we've been telling people to work harder, write better grants, etc. but at the end of the day... There's only so much money. Exactly, exactly. And that will only be addressed when we really start to uh, confront our national priorities or the private sector decides to step up and, and, um, and we make a new merging of those interests. So in the book, you um, what, one of the things I also love about the book is you it, it's a it's a workplace love story in the sense that you seem to love your work, you love your colleagues, in particular you talk about your your research partner Bill, and you come away feeling like I want to work I want to work with Hope <laughs> and Bill. I mean, were you hesitant about sharing that sort of that personal passion and love for you have, or was it just a natural part of how you how you tell your story? I was terrified that I would go my whole career and not get to share that part of it because it. Really really has been the most important part. Um, the, the fact that I've been able to work with people I love and live as brother and sister with people while um, really maximizing what we can think about and what we can do and challenging ourselves in all, all these different ways, I felt like that was the most important part of the story and it was something I was never going to get to write down 
as a scientific report yeah. or as a journal article. It was just, it was the invisible part of what we did and yet it was the whole reason we did it. Talk a little bit about the work you're doing, the research that you're doing on plants. You talk about some interesting things that plants have memory and some interesting research that you've uncovered. Give us a sense of sort of your research arc and where it's going, where, where it's taking you to the future. Right, so plants are alive. They are alive as we're alive, but they're equally alive. That's something I spend a lot of time trying to absorb very deeply and communicate very deeply. Um, plants are also useful to us. Agriculture is based on plants. Um, the amount of wood that we use is, is still a major resource for humankind. And the ground rules for how plants make a living are changing due to human activities. I'm interested in the tipping point where we reach that with plant biology, where we flooded the atmosphere with so much carbon dioxide that all of biology, from a plant's perspective, becomes about water, becomes about nitrogen. Uh, and from a big shift like that, what do we expect for agriculture? What do we expect for forestry? You literally plant seeds for the future. Most of us use that metaphorically. You literally do. Here's hoping you lots of success. I'll be listening, watching, reading. <laughs> I, I, I'll, uh, I'll do my best to make sure everyone does. So thanks a lot, Hope. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks. My pleasure. There's a great lesson in talking to Hope. She's a wonderful communicator, and I think uh, above being a great scientist, we can also learn from her and what it means to communicate very complicated subjects like science. She gave herself a challenge in writing her book to make sure that no one had to look up a single word to understand what she was talking about. I think that's something that all of us can take away when we're trying to push for new ideas, lead in innovation. It's all about making the idea accessible. This is the future in five.